You'll never defeat God, too, if you don't first defeat me, the Basement King. Game bosses are a big deal. Final bosses get all the glory and their own personal soundtrack, but first bosses are important too, and are much easier to overlook. The first boss is where many games kick into second gear, and the misfire there can take a game off the rails before it even really gets going. Still, there are tons of different ways to make a first boss memorable and effective, depending on what facets of the game you want to emphasize. Let's talk about first bosses, and how to design that initial big encounter. Know what game could use a first boss? Mini Metro. A fantastical transportation monster you have to defeat in, uh, London. Alright, I need to work on my world building, which I can do with today's episode sponsor, Skillshare. They've got a class called Science Fiction and Fantasy, creating unique and powerful worlds. It's tough to create a world from scratch, and even tougher to make one in sci-fi or fantasy when the rules can be basically anything you can imagine. Lincoln Michael takes you through some guidelines and principles that can help you make a cohesive, unique setting full of vibrant characters. Get access to that and thousands of additional classes on Skillshare. It's an online learning community built by and for creative and curious people, full of experts teaching you about writing, graphic design, productivity, animation, illustration, and way more. Skillshare classes get straight to the point. Most are under 60 minutes with short lessons to fit into your schedule and zero ads. You gotta sign up quickly though. The first thousand people to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can explore your creativity. Try it out, it's really good. Why are first bosses so important to a game anyway? Sure, they could be like any other boss you'll find later in the game, but the best first bosses can play many special roles. They can be an introduction to how bosses generally go, a first major test on your understanding of a game's mechanics, a natural climax within the game's opening chapter or level that hooks the player into the rest of the game. The first boss lives in a place that holds big opportunities. How that first boss gets designed can vary depending on what you want to emphasize with it, the game's mechanics or the game's story. These aren't exclusive. Some first bosses do both, but we'll get to that later. Either way, the first boss helps kick the game into its next phase by establishing what the chapter sized gameplay loop looks like. It's not the final destination, but it is a heading. Mechanics driven first bosses focus on taking what you've learned early in the game, twisting it, changing it, or moving it forward. They can be straightforward but more demanding tests. They can force you to consider parts of the battle system you've learned so far in a different light. Some even act as gates, guaranteeing that you know what you're doing before going any further. Hollow Knight doesn't guarantee that you'll encounter him as your first boss, but more often than not, you'll start with the False Knight. The False Knight is an excellent mechanical warm-up, and is a template for how the game expects you to approach the fights to come. Look at him. He's huge. His gigantic jumps, shockwaves, and big arcing mace swings are all pretty intimidating. At first. He's not a pushover, but he looks tougher than he is. These big attacks follow an easy to predict pattern. You'll quickly find a nice rhythm of dodging and hitting. Get a few hits in yourself and you'll see he wasn't so tough on the inside after all. Now that you have some more confidence, the second phase begins. The False Knight's voice now hints that he might be the one panicking. The attacks are faster, and falling rocks are added to the mix. If you're feeling adventurous, you might discover that you can hit the rocks back at the boss if you get the positioning and timing right for some extra damage. This fight is a simpler template of the ones to come. Later bosses use the same multi-stage pattern and have their own environmental and tactical secrets to discover. But what if the player is struggling and getting low on health? Well, that's an intentional learning moment too. Remember, this is one of the first bosses. It's not meant to be very punishing yet. There are lulls where the player can regain some health with their slow healing ability, but only if you can identify the right times to use it. The game wants you to be careful with your healing. If you try to do it at the wrong time, you can easily do more harm than good. The game is teaching you that maybe it's better to learn how to not get hit in the first place. The False Knight is a great expectation setter. It's an approachable introduction to the patterns of future fights, with a boss who will try to intimidate you, secret tactics to discover, and an emphasis on timing over healing, but all of that in an encounter with relatively low stakes.
Another great use of the first boss is to quash some bad habits before they become too ingrained in the player. The original Skyward Sword's combat system was designed with motion controls as its centerpiece. You swung the controller in a specific direction, and Link would more or less mimic what you were doing. Enemies would have these weird looking defensive stances to blatantly telegraph how you'd have to swing your sword to get around. Some enemies changed their stance, and you'd have to change how you attack to compensate. It looks ridiculous in isolation, but the nuance of the directional sword swings, positioning, and a new shield-based parry system freshened up the usual Zelda combat with something that could only be done on the Wii. This had a ripple effect on the standard use dungeon item to win style of Zelda boss design. Skyward Sword's emphasis on swordplay led to one of the more exciting opening bosses in the series, Girahim. Girahim is a natural escalation of the combat the game had given you so far, but his fight acts as a filter for combat styles. If you had waggled your way through all the normal enemies up through this point with reckless sword swings, Girahim served as your wake-up call. After a great introduction that establishes Girahim's sadistic and overconfident personality, the fight starts with him toying with you. He's unarmed and just holds out his hand with a red aura around it. If you strike there, he'll grab the sword with his bare hand. If you don't pull it away quickly enough, he'll disarm you and take the blade for himself, swinging at you for a bit before chucking it back at you to try again. He won't take the initiative in the fight. He waits for you and only counterattacks if he takes your sword. You have to get through his defenses by taking full advantage of the motion controls. Lead his hand with your sword, then quickly strike in another direction. After a few more hits, Girahim will start to take you a bit more seriously, pull out his own sword, and start the second phase. He'll use new moves that emphasize speed and timing and teleport around. You have to quickly read his stance and strike when he leaves himself open. You can run, parry, or even counter his new moves if you read them properly. Once you seem to have understood how to counterattack, the fight will end and he'll leave you to fight another day. The whole encounter is pretty demanding for a first boss in a Zelda game but in a way that makes sure you understand the more advanced aspects of this new, somewhat gimmicky control scheme before the game gets too far along. It's not terribly difficult once you pass that test, but the filtering purpose of the fight makes it very different than the usual early Zelda boss fare. The most straightforward way to botch a first boss is to make them too hard. It's okay to challenge the player, but you don't want the first boss to be a severe difficulty spike. At least not unless you have something else planned. The first boss of Mega Man Network Transmission, Fireman, is absurdly difficult for a fight you'll reach in the first 20 minutes of the game. Fireman hits hard, his attacks take a quarter of your health and come at you very quickly. It's very tough to avoid, especially for a player just beginning to get the hang of things. Your own basic attack is pathetically weak at this early stage, so your best bet of getting through alive is hoping that your sub-weapon and ability chips include something powerful. Also, you get those abilities at random from a deck of cards you can draw from every so often. You can customize this deck, but you won't be doing that this early on. It's actually a good idea to wait outside the boss room and reroll your sub-weapon chips until the game decides to give you a decent loadout before you start the fight. Win or lose, the fight is over in 30 seconds. There's nothing wrong with a stiff challenge, but the first boss right after a heavily tutorialized and easy stage is a weird time to put a difficulty spike that even later bosses don't often reach. The game has a live system too, so lose too many times and you'll have to start the whole level over from scratch. The quick twitch gameplay, disproportionate damage output, randomized elements, and unforgiving live system combine to make a boss uniquely unsuited to be the first boss. Okay. So what else can first bosses do besides provide a mechanical challenge? First bosses are great places to put a big inflection point that properly kicks off the game's main story. They serve most often to resolve the first crisis and an opportunity to start a longer term one. They can reveal that while you've won the battle, it's just the first act of a much longer campaign on the horizon. It marks a place where you can feel safer assuming that the player knows the basics of the setting and characters, and you can use that as the staging ground to build the deeper narrative. Story-focused bosses usually take a longer time to set up than mechanics-focused ones. You'll have to build more backstory and information into the fight to make taking them down feel like a good payoff. Kamoshida in Persona 5 is... Wow. He's trying to speedrun his way to jail. Kamoshida is a walking arrest waiting to happen. No one else seems to be doing anything about it, 
So you kids have to take them down yourselves, I guess. The Kamoshida Dungeon sets up Persona 5's main story threats and how you'll go about taking out the untouchable people in the game's society. Kamoshida is an incredibly easy villain to hate. Thanks to the pre-boss setup for his zillion crimes and how they directly affect the central cast and sets up a good immediate revenge story. It creates and resolves the first iteration of the loop that you'll keep going down for the rest of the game, establishing the origins of the Phantom Thieves, as well as setting up the deeper mechanics of the metaverse that will play a bigger role later. The dungeon and boss fight are metaphors for Kamoshida's crimes, which helps keep it all feeling like a cohesive package. Kamoshida is a first boss that is great at setting up the game's story and themes, while giving immediate goals and a great sense of satisfaction once you take him out. Story-focused first bosses are great vehicles for selling an abridged version of the game, but it is better if it's abridged. Take Ace Attorney. Oh, you don't think Ace Attorney has bosses? Nonsense. They're like the visual novel equivalent of a Monster Hunter game. They're filled with nothing but bosses. The first villain of Ace Attorney is Frank Saw It, and he's as guilty as you can get. You know he did it, you saw him do it, now just take him down. The case gameplay isn't as intricate as it will get in the later cases, this one just focuses on reading comprehension and pointing out the contradictions to his story. He can't help but perjure himself over and over again, so the case is pretty speedy from start to finish. But that fits perfectly as the first case in this game. Ace Attorney is at its most fun when you finally corner a criminal as their story collapses on itself, and watch them have an over-the-top breakdown. The tension in the courtroom rises with each testimony that you find contradictions in, and you get closer and closer to the part where he throws his toupee at you. And Frank's case is an abridged version of that to show newcomers what the payoff to one of these cases can be. It's great for hooking players into the series. Justice For All, the second Ace Attorney game, does the same thing. The exact same thing. But worse. Richard Wellington is super guilty. He's a snooty con man who clearly did it. And he's about twice as unlikable as Frank. But his case is twice as long. Wellington serves no greater purpose beyond Justice For All's tutorial, so it's not as if his case builds towards a larger plot arc. The case is just as simple as the original tutorial, but padded out over more time. Returning players don't get a mechanically satisfying case to solve and new players don't get that immediate story payoff like with Frank. Wellington ends up feeling more like filler because it tries to have it both ways. Justice For All is a sequel in a story-heavy series, so it's not very likely a new player will start with this case anyway, and won't really need an abridged starter case to understand the game's appeal. With a weaker sense of purpose, Wellington becomes a weaker first boss. It's a lesson the series has learned from, however. Most of the rest of the first culprits in the series are incorporated more organically into the main storyline, making them more elaborate and satisfying to play while still being solid introductory bosses. But you know, nothing is keeping a boss from being both of these at once. Some really excellent first bosses are both deeply ingrained in the story and have fun mechanical tests and twists. Toriel is the first real boss in Undertale, and her fight is the definitive conclusion of the prologue, heralds the rest of the story to come, and is the first major consequential appearance of the game's signature, Spare Mechanic. Toriel appears right in the beginning to save you from a flower, then very, very carefully guides you through the next environmental puzzles to her home. By the time you want to leave there, she'll reluctantly try to stop you from accessing the areas beyond. For your own safety, the fight itself is, on its face, not all that special if you approach it like a typical RPG boss. But all of Toriel's dialogue and actions point to how reluctant she is to be fighting you. Undertale's battle system is most notable for its spare mechanic, and this is one of the first major chances to use it if you choose. The fight becomes way more interesting when there's no fighting. Toriel will half-heartedly prod you to either fight or run away, but doing neither is always an option. The earlier tutorial fights she helps you in revolve around talking it out with your opponent, and this one can be too. Keep showing mercy and the dialogue will slowly change without repeating, which helps signal that you are actually getting somewhere. If you get low on health, she'll even deliberately stop trying to hit you. Keep it up and you'll gain the ability to resolve the fight without violence, which cements to the player that this is a viable option. Not only do you get to keep going in the story, but the act of sparing has dramatic consequences to the rest of the story structure. The playstyle the player chooses is the most consequential decision they will make in a run of Undertale. 
and it all starts by sparing Toreo. So that's a couple of things to focus on when designing a first boss. Check out the discussion in the comments and let us know your favorite first boss that really set the tone for the rest of the game. Or maybe you're thinking of one that cranked up the difficulty faster than you expected. Thanks to all you commenters, by the way. I don't mention it enough, but I love the quality of the discussion that pops up in the comments on my videos. It's a rare thing to see. First bosses are a tone setter and help great games start out on the right foot.